All over the internet, I see alleged Star Trek fans claiming that the problem with new Star Trek shows is they're too woke, or that modern Star Trek is just too political. But they're wrong, and I'm going to use 57 years of Trek history to prove it with a series of videos, each focusing on a different era of Star Trek from the original series to the modern day. Today, we're going to focus on the original series and early Star Trek prior to the next generation, so let's get into it. Let's go ahead and get it out of the way here at the top of the video, and hopefully for the rest of the series. The word woke was originally coined by black activists in regards to political issues as specifically applied to racism. It has been misappropriated to mean a great number of things, but for conservatives and their ilk, it basically just means thing I don't like. And the thing they don't like is generally inclusive casting or any overtly political storytelling. They want subtle political allegory like classic Trek, damn it. Look at me. You're black on one side and white on the other. I am black on the right side. I've failed to see the significant difference. Loki is white on the right side. All of his people are white on the right side. Yup. Subtle. Now, I want to talk about Star Trek, the original series, and Gene's vision. Ah, Gene! Oh, Gene, isn't he the best? Gene Roddenberry, the celebrated creator of Star Trek, has gone on at length on numerous occasions describing his vision for Trek, which was to depict a future for humanity to strive for. What Star Trek proves, as faulty as individual episodes could be, is that the much maligned common man and common woman has an enormous hunger for brotherhood. They are ready for the 23rd century now, and they are light years ahead of their petty governments and their visionless leaders. And to celebrate infinite diversity in infinite combinations. Infinite diversity from infinite combinations. Thank whatever created us, we are different, each of us and everything around us. To the end of time, if it ever does end, no combination will ever come up quite the same. I am an alien, <laughs> and so are you. And yet, somehow we're also part of each other and part of everything that is. Which translated directly to casts with intentional racial and gender diversity. The diversity of the casting of Star Trek all came from Gene. This was Gene's idea that it would be one world. And usually a couple aliens. And that's not the only time Roddenberry has praised diversity as central to the themes of Star Trek either. He's been quoted as saying, The whole show was an attempt to say that humanity will reach maturity and wisdom on the day that it begins not just to tolerate, but to take a special delight in differences in ideas and differences in life forms. If we cannot learn to actually enjoy those small differences, take a positive delight in those small differences between our own kind here on this planet, then we do not deserve to go out into space and meet the diversity that's almost certainly out there. And I think this is what people responded to. Roddenberry apparently identified as a communist, according to his wife, Majel Barrett. But I wasn't able to find confirmation of this beyond statements that she said it at a convention. That said, I believe it, since Roddenberry's ideal future was explicitly anti-capitalist, with frequent mentions that Earth no longer has formal countries or uses money. It's a miracle these people ever got out of the 20th century. They're still using money. We've got to find something. Something carried forward in every iteration of Star Trek. A lot has changed in the past 300 years. People are no longer obsessed with the accumulation of things. We have eliminated hunger, want the need for possessions. We've grown out of our infancy. A huge element of the purpose of Star Trek was to show what humanity could achieve without petty divisions over things like race, gender, nationality, etc. As a matter of fact, we decided to risk the whole show on, on that premise. We believe that the often ridiculed mass audience is sick of this world's petty nationalism and all its old ways and old hatreds, and that people are not only willing but anxious to think beyond those petty beliefs that have for so long kept mankind divided. These are not centrist or right-wing ideals. It's an openly progressive philosophy. I want to take a moment to disclaim that neither Gene Roddenberry or his attempt to execute his vision are perfect. And I suspect praise on women because women are more easily and more deeply terrified, generating more sheer horror than the male of the species. Like, not even close. Despite his efforts to include women in Star Trek, he was often misogynistic in his interactions with and portrayal of them. And Leonard Nimoy stated in no uncertain terms in an interview that he felt Roddenberry was anti-Semitic, despite the way he availed himself to Jewish talent. Even with his charming public persona and undeniable contributions to sci-fi and pop culture through Star Trek, it seems like he wasn't always a great guy in private. 
We should stop measuring Trek against what he would have wanted. We can hold on to the good parts of Roddenberry's vision without lionizing him. And I actually think modern Trek has done quite well at upholding the parts of his vision that are worth preserving, while improving upon its realization with every subsequent incarnation of Star Trek we get as we collectively learn to do better. Now I want to talk a little bit about the production of the original series, because Star Trek was actually almost lost to the fires of production hell. Roddenberry pitched his first draft in 1964 to Desilu Productions, a small company owned by Lucille Ball. On that note, everyone say thank you Lucille Ball for making Star Trek happen because she fought for it. Desilu Productions had a first look deal with CBS, but they already had Lost in Space, which was basically Swiss Family Robinson, but in space. So they passed. I haven't seen the original Lost in Space, but I did really like the Netflix adaptation. Next, Desilu pitched it to NBC, who commissioned the unaired pilot The Cage, featuring Captain Pike and a female first officer played by Majel Barrett, the extremely competent number one. He needs help. He probably needs it fast. Engineering deck will rig the transmit ship's power. We'll try blasting through that metal. The network didn't bite, but they went the unusual route of requesting a second pilot where no man has gone before. After which, NBC decided to go forward with the series and Star Trek as we know it was born. Nimoy's Spock was the only character retained in the main cast from The Cage, and Majel Barrett was the only other actor from the first pilot to be among the main cast in the series, although she plays Nurse Chapel rather than Number One, because Number One tested poorly with audiences, including female audiences, which is interesting. In the new pilot, we are introduced to Kirk, Scotty, and Sulu. Mr. Scott, would you repeat what you just told us? About an hour ago, the bridge control started going crazy. If you want the mathematics of this, Mitchell's ability is increasing geometrically. We meet McCoy and Uhura starting in The Man Trap. This man shouldn't be dead. I can't find anything wrong with him. According to all the tests, he should get up and just walk away from here. I'm guessing, of course, but you do look a little lonely. I see. So naturally, when I'm lonely, I think of you which was the first Star Trek episode to air publicly on September 8th, 1966. It initially premiered with high ratings, although that didn't last long. However, in spite of several hurdles, including more than one near cancellation, Trek grew an incredibly devoted fan base and became one of the most beloved and profitable franchises of all time. But hey, go woke, go broke, right? Now, let's talk a little bit about the politics of the original series. Star Trek premiered with one of, if not the most, diverse cast on American TV at the time. He also, um, with um, the way he cast the show, made another powerful commentary. It was, you know, week after week, you saw that pluralistic uh, team. This was in and of itself a political choice in an era where racial segregation and other forms of legal discrimination based on race and gender were just beginning to be somewhat dismantled in the wake of the hard-won victories of civil rights activists and the growing feminist movement and during the escalating U.S. involvement in Vietnam. And so what Gene did was he used science fiction as a metaphor to comment on these issues of civil civil rights or the Vietnam War and... In almost uh, each epi- uh, every episode, there was some commentary made on these issues. Along with William Shatner as Kirk, Leonard Nimoy as Spock, James Doohan as Scotty. What do you think of that? I don't know. And DeForest Kelly as Dr. McCoy, later joined by Walter Koenig as Chekhov in season two. One per six, sir. Close enough to smell them. That is illogical, Ensign. Odors cannot travel through the vacuum of space. It's also notable that Star Trek aired during the Cold War. Pablo Chekhov at a time when we were locked in the Cold War. I was making a little joke, sir. And there we had a trusted colleague who was proud of his Russian heritage, spoke with a Russian accent. Oh, Quator Pritikeli. I've read about this, but uh, I've never seen any before. Does everybody know about the suite but me? Well, not everyone, Captain. It's a Russian invention. The main cast also included George Takei as Lieutenant Sulu. By a debris scattering your head, sir. And the now legendary Nichelle Nichols as Lieutenant Nyota Uhura. Hailing frequencies open, sir. Both of whom were significant at a time when there were very few mainstream roles for anyone who wasn't white that weren't cruel or ignorant stereotypes. Analysis sector. I didn't see any other women playing roles like that when I was growing up. You know, they had either some domestic job, they might have been an actress or a dancer. The role of Nyota Uhura, created specifically for Nichelle Nichols, was particularly special. Well, she's the most important person on the bridge. When Lieutenant Uhura says, Captain, everybody turns around to look. You cannot help but fall in love with her. 
Seeing her on television had a huge impact for a lot of people, including Whoopi Goldberg, who cited her as an inspiration to pursue acting. This was a huge part of my life because as a kid who loved science fiction, it wasn't until Lieutenant Uhura did I realize that I was in the future. Martin Luther King Jr. saw her role as so important that he encouraged her to remain on Star Trek when she mentioned she was considering leaving the show to pursue a career on Broadway. Dr. Martin Luther King, my leader, is mo walking toward me. I said, well, I'm leaving Star Trek. He's, he said, you cannot. You cannot. For the first time on television, we will be seen as we should be seen every day. In the original series, Uhura is fourth in command of the Enterprise. She's proudly Kenyan, and we even see her speak Swahili on screen. Swahili. She's smart, self-assured, capable. Speed is essential, Lieutenant. If it isn't done just right, I could blow the entire communication system. It's very delicate work, sir. I can think of no one better equipped to handle it, Miss Uhura. Funny. No. I'll protect you, fair maiden. Sorry, neither. And musical. The skies are green and glowing. Michelle Nichols makes her unforgettable even when the writing fails her which it often does because the original series had a bit of a problem with its female and non-white characters. Why don't you tell me I'm an attractive young lady or ask me if I've ever been in love? Well, it does well for the era by including women and people of color in command roles at all, and as equal, respected members of the crew, it often fails to treat them as fully realized characters. <laughs> because all through the first season, I lobbied Gene Roddenberry for more for Sulu to do. Likely a symptom of the writing room looking like this most of the time. They often portrayed women as delicate and emotional. They were unarmed when the men wielded phasers, and when they had significant screen time, it generally revolved around a man in some romantic capacity. One article referred to their characterization as doe-eyed and lovesick, which I think captures the problem quite well, especially with Nurse Chapel. In one of the original series' worst episodes, Turnabout Intruder, which was written by Roddenberry himself, a woman body swaps with Kirk because Starfleet won't let women become captains. But the crew figures it out because Kirk is acting incredibly emotional and irrational. Violence by the lady perpetrated on Captain Kirk. I asked the assembled personnel to look at Dr. Janice Lester and visualize that historic moment. To attain a position she doesn't merit by temperament or training. And most of all, she wanted to murder James Kirk, a man who once loved her. Oof. It is notable, though, that Star Trek actually subtly retconned this with the unnamed captain of the Saratoga in Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home. With Sulu and Uhura, they mainly suffered from not getting enough screen time despite being named and regularly seen characters. It'd be a close-up on you, and then it, sh it would sh uh, shift to Bill, and then you you'd see Bill in a whispered conversation with the director, and the setup was changed, and it was on Bill, and you were the offstage voice. In spite of this, it only takes a simple Google search to find dozens of articles, forum posts, comments, blogs, and personal anecdotes about how much these characters and this representation meant to people then and continues to mean to people today. Being on Star Trek, uh, so many people came up and told me that uh, for the first time they have someone that uh, they can relate to and be proud because they saw an Asian character who was not a stereotype who was uh, in many ways a hero, who was part of you know, the uh, leadership team. Lieutenant Uhuru on that stage, you know, he's right behind the captain's shoulder, was a big thing. You there know. were many little girls, black, white, yellow, brown, red, green, <laughs> wanted to be Uhura. Loved to work. Both Takei and Nichols used every second of screen time that they had to make their characters as memorable as possible to great effect. But representation wasn't the only way that Star Trek expressed its political vision. It's baked into the show, and it often isn't even subtext. Star Trek was so intentionally political that the writers would often slip in something racy, like an open-mouthed kiss, into a particularly controversial episode to distract the censors from looking too closely at the more political elements of the story. So to be clear, not only has Trek always been political, it's often tried to be 
more explicitly political, frequently skirting the absolute limits of what censorship of the Hays Code era would allow. In one episode in particular, though, the racy choice itself was political. In Plato's stepchildren, Uhura and Kirk are under the influence of aliens and share a kiss. Many things about the episode don't age well now, but at the time, the studio balked at airing it because a kiss between a black person and a white person was seen as taboo. Apparently, they filmed the scene with and without the kiss, but Nichols and Shatner intentionally made small mistakes in the alternate takes so that the studio would be forced to use the one with the kiss. In another example of early Trek getting political, the original series has addressed the Vietnam War in at least four different episodes that showed the evolving way that progressives and the writers themselves viewed the war and America's involvement. The first episode, The City at the Edge of Tomorrow, addressed the anti-war movement early on in the conflict, framing it as well-meaning, even revolutionary, but ultimately at risk of undermining the effort to prevent totalitarian governments from taking over vast swaths of the world. In the late 1930s, a growing pacifist movement whose influence delayed the United States entry into the Second World War. Fascism. Hitler. One Second World War. Because all this lets them develop the A-bomb first. This episode was not anti-war, but it was pro-progressive politics. The second episode we see with themes about the Vietnam War is A Private Little War. A grim affair where the Federation discovers the Klingons, an allegory for the Soviet Union, are arming a population with guns on a primitive planet that Kirk previously compared to Eden. Kirk resolves to arm the other side to even out the fight, which he does with a grim reluctance. A hundred serpents. Serpents for the Garden of Eden. We're very tired, Mr. Spark. Beam us up home. The episode was still on the side of the administration of the United States and generally framed U.S. involvement as a necessary evil. The third episode which addresses the conflict is the Omega Glory, which features a desolate planet populated by the warring Yangs, or Yanks, and Comms, or Communists, fighting a senseless war. The primitive Yangs are poised to potentially destroy the Combs. Kirk discovers the tattered remains of the American flag and the preamble of the Constitution and uses American patriotism to argue for globalism and against senseless war on communism. In tall words, proudly saying, we the people was not written for the chiefs of kings, or the warriors, or the rich, or the powerful, but for all the peoples. And the words that follow were not written only for the Yangs, but for the Koms as well. The Koms. They must apply to everyone, or they mean nothing. Do you understand? It's another fairly preachy episode, with Kirk and Spock going so far as to spell out who the Yangs and Koms represent. Yangs? Yanks? Spock? Yankees? Koms? Communists. The parallel is almost too close, Captain. Just in case the allegory was too subtle for us. The episode is certainly problematic in a lot of ways, but at the time, it represented the evolving American skepticism towards the Vietnam War, with many Star Trek writers, including Roddenberry himself, ultimately signing on to a public statement against U.S. involvement. The fourth episode is actually more focused on racism against black people in America with Let This Be Your Last Battlefield, which again is downright preachy in the obviousness of its allegory. I'm sure y'all were just waiting for this episode to come up because it is the example of ham-fisted early Trek politics. See, they're fighting over who is black and white on which side. He is of the same breed as yourself. Are you blind, Commander Spock? Oh, look at me. When they're exactly the same, actually. I am black on the right side. I fail to see the significant difference. And one has been subjugating the other using this arbitrary difference as justification for centuries. He raided our homes, tore us from our families, herded us together like cattle, and then sold us as slaves. They were savages, Captain. He educated them. Yes, just education enough to serve the master race. And now they're going to destroy each other for no reason. All the people are dead. All dead, Captain. They have annihilated each other. Stop it! What do you do? You hear Spock? The planet is dead. There's nobody alive on Sharon because of hate. Wow, much subtle, so deep. But this episode also features commentary on the disproportionate death of black soldiers in Vietnam. Do you know what it would be like to be dragged out of your hovel into a war on another planet? A battle that will serve your oppressor and bring death to you and your brothers. 
There are many other examples of episodes of the original series that feature explicit political themes, so let's rattle off a few more. A Taste of Armageddon, in which Kirk shows two warring societies the horrifying realities of real war, which they had obfuscated through a computer war. If this is some sort of a game you're playing. This is no game, Captain. Half a million people have just been killed. Activate the attack unit, sir. Yes, Councilman. Launch immediate counterattack. Computers, Captain. They fight their war with computers. With real casualties that addresses both the horrors and increasingly impersonal nature of war. Computers don't kill a half a million people. Deaths have been registered. Of course, they have 24 hours to report. To report. To our disintegration machines. There's Errand of Mercy, which features a higher order species showing both the Federation and the Klingons the errors of their warlike ways. I also stand upon the home planet of the Klingon Empire and the home planet of your Federation, Captain. I'm going to put a stop to this insane war. You're what? They're talking nonsense. We find interference in other people's affairs. Most disgusting. But you gentlemen have given us no choice. There's a really poorly executed pro-choice abortion allegory in the Mark of Gideon. The birth rate continued to rise and the population grew until now Gideon is encased in a living mass and let your people learn about the devices to safely prevent conception. The Federation will provide anything you need. The people of Gideon have always believed that life is sacred. We are incapable of destroying or interfering with the creation of that which we love so deeply. Life, in every form, from fetus to a developed being. They tried. Listen, I said Trek was always political. I didn't say it was always good. There's also Balance of Terror, which shows the futility and tragedy of war and the loss of who people might have been, but for forced conflicts. I regret that we meet in this way. You and I are of a kind. In a different reality, I could have called you friend. All of these episodes had very clear intentions, although few of them age particularly well beyond being acknowledged as important political commentary for their era. But at the time, they were incredibly progressive. The original series was finally cancelled for the last time after its third season in 1969. But the franchise would come back with several movies in the 70s, 80s, and into the 90s after gaining popularity with reruns. In this era, we were also treated to Star Trek the Animated Series, which started airing on September 8th, 1973, with the entire main cast reprising their roles as voice actors. Hey, wait a minute! We didn't cause this to happen! Tell that to the captain. I'm gonna report on both of you just as soon as they... Both the movies and the animated series attempted to make up for some of the oversights and limitations of the original series. The animated series actually features some surprisingly dense storytelling and often gives Uhura more to do. Probe directed at ship from planet surface is severely innovating to humanoid males. Including commanding the ship and rescuing the male bridge crew with the help of an all-female security team in one episode. Lieutenant Uhura to security officer Davison. Davison here. I want an all-woman security team on every transporter immediately. Aye, aye, Lieutenant. What are you doing? Taking command of this ship. I read somewhere that Uhura was supposed to take command in an episode of the original series, but the studio wouldn't allow it. So Roddenberry specifically wanted to put her in command in the animated series. I had trouble verifying it, but it's not exactly unbelievable. I'll be the first to admit that the original series isn't my favorite Star Trek, but I am still grateful to it for giving us the platform to launch the rest of the franchise. And there are individual episodes and pieces of commentary from the original series that are still painfully relevant today. But if this video didn't convince you that Star Trek is inherently political, tune in next time for a look at TNG and 90s era Trek. Let me know what your favorite political the original series episodes are in the comment section down below. Did I miss any you were hoping to see? Like, share, and subscribe for more videos. See you next time. Peter Zane.